Okay. Uh, <coughs> Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. And good afternoon to all the participants. <coughs> I hope everyone can uh, can hear us. Can hear me? Yes, yes. We can hear you. Okay. I'm sorry that I have to present from uh, recovery OT area because this is the only space that I have the internet connection and in, and the power supply. Um, so there's only five, 55 participants for now. So I think uh, while waiting for the... Uh, Prof. Ibrahim is here uh, as a, an expert uh, panel. So uh, we shall start our session in this evening with uh, Umul Kita Al-Fatihah. So uh, just a few uh, uh, messages for the presentation. So in this evening, we will continue with other five uh, group presentation. Uh, I think everybody's uh, already ready with the presentation. So we try to finish up the session today earlier uh, because we have the problem with the internet and power supply and all. So... Uh, we're still waiting for other expert panel and uh, uh, to, to come in and join us in the Zoom platform. Uh, Dr. Iqbal, I think we can just proceed. Uh, Inshallah, this is a recorded version. So later on, okay. we can discuss later. Uh, yeah, thank you. Okay. So... Um, for this evening, we will uh, proceed with three, uh, five presentation, which is start with Rusa, and then Wudu, fasting, uh, and then Hajj, and we finish up with the uh, AUB abnormal uterine bleeding. So I think I shall call upon the first uh, first group. I mean, first group for this evening session, uh, with the team of Rusa, uh, and the. So may I have the representative from the group uh, to start sharing the uh, presentation and start presenting your discussion. Yeah, um, salam and good afternoon. I'm Dinesh Naidu, uh, representative from the fourth group. Uh, on behalf of my group members, which consists of uh, Shai, Muhammad Shamil, Muhammad Daniel, 70, and Muhammad Shamil. Uh, we'll present on Ruksha. Uh, supervisor is uh, uh, SM Prof. Dr. Muhammad Irfan. Shall I proceed, Dr.? Yes, yes, please. All right. Okay. Um, just a brief introduction, uh, description of Ruksha and Sola. Ruksha is one of the most important rules in Islamic jurisprudence, fixed that closely connected to medical practice. Is defined as an exception to the original rule due to substantial and valid excuses. It also can be defined as leniency or concession for Mukallaf, who is a capable person, in performing Allah's commandment in certain situations due to obstacle or any matter permitting exception for general principle. So the concept and ruling of Ruksha is the rule of Ruksha is permissible to perform based on the spirit of leniency and removal of hardship for the affected Muslims can be applied to eliminate difficulties that are not severe or not in extreme need. The understanding of this concept would allow physicians to guide their Muslim patients continue to fulfill the ob their obligation as Muslims and meet their limitations and suffering as a result of sickness. All right, examples of critical situation involving performance of a prayer are number one, sickness of causing prayer to not be performed normally, travel of good intention, continuous heavy rainfall, rescuing flood victims, flight and extinguishing critical fire, treating patients in critical wards involving two or three periods of prayer, inability of cleaning the body and clothes stained with excrement, strong fearful situation, and lastly, inability of facing Qibla normally. 
So the form of Ruksha for prayer in critical situation are performing prayer as Jama or Kasa, performing prayer as Jama only, performing prayer as Jama Suri, performing prayer by sitting or lying down. So going on to uh, our first case scenario, uh, you know, doing rounds in surgical ward when suddenly in a patient in the ward who is currently on a stoma bag in which the feces or its contents are always present in the stoma bag, ask you either he can perform solar. How about if the feces come out during solar and what is the response? So um, in reference to the this Ishad al Fatwa series that you do, uh, obligatory but for patients who are always in hadas, which is in pure state, the patient, those who have to wear the colostomy or continuous bladder drainage bag is always in hard dust, which is an impure state. The bags are replaceable when they are full and it's not harmful to patient to use water. Patients able to use water to take bath the same way as healthy people and can perform obligatory bath. Patients who intend to take obligatory, obligatory bath should clean the place the feces are extracted changes the bag which it is contains with urine or feces within with new bags. Take the bath by washing his or her whole body. Patient can then fulfill the valid condition for prayer and perform his prayers when he's performing the obligatory bath. If feces are excreted into the bag when patient is performing prayer, it is forgiven because patient is in desperate or exigent situation. Therefore, the prayer is valid and does not have to replace his prayer. But the frequency of going to the bathroom to perform their prayers will be a great burden. All right. So it is permissible for patients to assemble to pray in this situation. This perm permissibility is concluded by Imam Ahmad Al-Qadi Hussein, al katabin also Al-Mutawali Al-Nawawi. There are two approaches for patients to assemble their prayer. First, assembling the prayer in the first or second Prayer time is Chama Takdim or Takhe. Assembling the prayer in the form of Suri representation, performing the first prayer at the end of its time and second prayer at the beginning of its time. Uh, note that prayers are permissible to perform Jama or Zuhu with Asar and Maghrib with Isha. So moving on to the second case, uh, whereby you and your colleagues are going to perform emergency OT at 2 p.m. and the OT time is expected to finish during Isha. What can be done in order not to miss the Asar or Maghrib prayers? So in this case, there are a few possibilities. First, uh, in elective setting where the patient is stable, surgeon may take turns with assistant to perform prayers in order to not miss the time. If preemptively anticipated, a long OT may perform prayers as Jama or Kasa. Emergency setting where the patient has relatively stabilized. If safe, may leave in turn to perform prayers, may perform prayers as Jama or Kasa. Uh, in a um, third situation whereby emergency setting where the patient is unstable and as a surgeon, you're not able to lift OT during this period. Consider as a uh, Dorurat allowed, allowed to perform prayers outside of time, allowed to perform prayers as Jama, allowed to observe prayers during procedure. Yeah, um, that's all uh, um, in regards to our presentation. Okay, um, thank you, Dr. Dinesh, for the presentation for uh, Rosa and the input for the two case scenarios that was given to them. Uh, so with that, I would like to invite uh, any uh, expert panels or any IOHK coordinator to add on on the, uh, on the, uh, on the presentation by this uh, group for Rosa. Assalamualaikum. Can I proceed first to take back? Ah, proceed first, okay. Yes, okay. Uh, okay. I really thank you to Dr. Dinesh and also his uh, group members. Uh, I, I think the, the presentation is, is concise and it's also accurate. Uh, the two scenarios that have been uh, given to them actually have been answered before by the previous speakers regarding uh, the necessity to, to perform solar when there's a feces in the stomach bag and also when, when, the, uh, when the clinics or the doctors need to go to the OT and uh, difficult to perform solar during on time. So I think this have been answered by Ustad Abdul Rahman previously so I think the answer is actually tally with the, the suggestion by Ustaz. So I have no idea for the input. Maybe we can ask Prof Ibrahim if Prof would like to say anything, Prof. Okay, how is will having a shaitan? Okay. 
الله خير Prof, can proceed, Prof. Can, can you hear us? Are you with us? Thank you for joining, Prof. Ibrahim. I would like to introduce that Prof. Ibrahim is a professor in science, School of Science. He's also one of the important person in Century Center of Examination of uh, Kuantan Campus, IIUM. Prof. Ibrahim? I think we lost him. Uh, I think it's okay, uh, Dr. Chiba. We can proceed to the next group. If there's no, no question from the other... Uh, okay, Prof. Ibrahim, you, you uh, may speak, Prof. Ibrahim. Uh, we can hear you, Prof. You can uh, unmute. Um, I think we shall proceed with the second presentation first. Uh, yes, I think so. I'm really sorry we can't hear you, Prof. Ibrahim. Uh, we will come to you later back. All right, thank you, Prof. Okay, so uh, I would like to invite the second group for this evening presentation. Uh, from a group of um, for the for the topic of wudu so i would like to invite the group of uh, dr halima uh, dr afidatul dr marain and dr abdul hamid one of the representative from your group to present on this uh, uh, task thank you Yeah, maybe I apologize for the disconnectivity. Yeah? Maybe I okay. come back again. Yes, after. yes, Prof. Yeah. Sure, sure. Okay. And, and if you can speak now, it's also okay, Prof. If you yeah, can so speak Yeah, so I now. just give very brief idea sure, about, sure, Prof. The, uh, about the presentation. And I'm just giving comments that we have experiencing very bad connectivity here. I mean, clearly of science. That's true. Yeah, so I miss uh, last talk in the morning session due to this. We have blackout also. Electricity yeah. all go out. Even right now, it's not okay, but I try to. Uh, regarding. Allahu Akbar. I think the internet is not stable. Okay, uh, we, we save that later in Dr. Iqbal. We proceed with the next yeah. group. Sorry. Can we, can we have a representative from the group uh, for the task we do? Yeah, so my voice is okay? Do yes, yes, I... Prof. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Please proceed, Prof. Thank you. Yeah, Prof. just I want to summarize that in case if there is any scenario happening, uh, the, the candidates or anybody or medical doctor, I think better just refer to the principles before you give that decision, that is a religious decision or the, what we call hukum. The best is you go to the principles. So you must make uh, your decision should be based on those principles given by uh, one of the speakers in the morning time, the first speaker I see, principles of the fiqh. For example, the uh, principle of darurat tabi'ul uh, mahzurat. For example, so which one you are employing in the specific scenario? So that is should be the, the case. Otherwise, uh, your decision maybe has no any uh, 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 what you call a uh, basis, legal basis from Islamic perspective. Because in Islam, to make a decision to say alloy or disalloy, you must give uh, 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 what you call argument or evidence for this. Why you say alloy? Why you say disalloy? For example. So that is the part which is the candidate need to know how they can attach any decision to its principle, either from Quran, either from Sunnah or either from the principle. Of course, the many cases is we related to the principles, okay? Principles, when we say decision, for example, the case which is the feces come out, so cannot control. So this, of course, many things, because tahara here is three. Tahara of the makan, of the place, cleaning of the place, cleaning of the body, and cleaning of the clothes which you have, okay? So uh, which one you cannot do it in a proper way, or even the three of them, you cannot do it in proper way, then a uh, ruksa may appear there. So uh, that is the focus point should be uh, the basis of making the decision, not the scenario itself. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Prof. Yeah.
thank you prof uh, for the input for the basic principle on uh, on manage uh, on finding solution for any problem during our day, uh, life life uh, day, daily life so again i would like to invite uh, a group for the task wudu uh, the representative, please uh, share. Uh, for group wudu, it's supposed to be Dr. Abdul Hamid Muhammad Yassin uh, who will be presenting. But I think maybe he, he tried to find a place for connection. Uh, maybe we can skip first. So maybe we can go to uh, the third, uh, third group okay. for the task fasting. Group consists of Dr. Muhammad Izzat, Dr. Hiranas, Dr. Fazlo and Dr. Madi. Uh -huh. Hello, hello. Yes, I'm. Um, uh, my group will be presenting on fasting, but uh, currently I'm walking to the main building hospital. So can you give me for another two minutes? Oh, okay. So I think why not we proceed with uh, Dr. Zaki's group from uh, Hajj. Dr. Zaki, are you joining now? Dr. Zaki? Uh, or maybe can we can open to yeah we can open to, uh, any group, any group right? who's uh, yeah. ready for presenting. Yeah, assalamualaikum. I'm from from group Dr Zaki also for Hajj. Are right. we? <laughs> I yes. think I can I can proceed. Proceed, proceed Dr Radin. Thank you very much. Uh, maybe can uh, everyone see my slide? Yes, we can see your slide. Okay. Yes. <clears throat> Ya, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Um, so, moderator Dr. Saiful and all the uh, panelists and all the uh, lecturers and all the colleagues, good afternoon. So, our group, <coughs> my name is Radin Stehaja. I'm uh, from a family medicine uh, department and um, I'm representing my group for uh, Big Hajj uh, consisted of uh, four uh, group members, uh, Zaki and also Rosalia, also from family department, and Hamwah uh, is from uh, NS department. Okay, so without further ado, I will <coughs> share it, uh, our dinner uh, with our presentation. So basically, um, the the Hajj, maybe, uh, maybe for the our clique that uh, non-Muslim that are not familiar with the Hajj, uh, with, uh, I will describe a bit about the uh, Haji. So the place uh, is actually uh, the one the visiting the house of Kaaba at certain times in the months of Hajj and Zulhijjah and perform obligations things for Hajj. So there's a difference of Haji and the Umrah. It's actually uh, only the timing of the uh, uh, cause Umrah can be, uh, you can do it uh, at any time. Uh, while uh, Hajj, uh, you have to do it at certain times only in the months of uh, Hajj. So, <clears throat> so that you can have a better uh, understanding what is the pilgrimage, uh, the Makkah, uh, uh, what the action that have involved in doing the Haji. Uh, there's a few things uh, that involved which is intention in ihram in arafah tawaf sa'i uh, cutting and shaving and also orderly on most pillars so as you can see from the pictures here uh, <clears throat> the pilgrim have to uh, from the Mecca they will begin the hajj by cycling the Kaaba for seven times and then they have to mina stop at mina to pray uh, read the quran and then they have uh, move 
on Arafah, uh, and then they have to Zalifa that uh top the rocks and then the uh, back to Mina for the stony throw rocks at the three pillars and then they have back the final return to Mina, uh, where they will circle the Kaaba uh, seven more times there. So uh it just to show that how uh the environment and how uh, the actions there have uh, imagined that there's more than two million groups there gathering and also the activities, physical activities that the uh, victim have to uh, do uh, hatch. <clears throat> so, how benefit in pilgrimage? So, uh, we can um, fight in a few uh, sections. And uh, the first one is actually we can uh, have a benefit spiritual. Uh, while the on the journey, uh, they have to re always repeat to uh, with citation, tabia, tasbih, and tahmid. And then it's hope that one spiritual purity that a love of good and health of evil may be instilled, and that one will expect from the useless practice, evil practice, fights, and uh, the likes of that. So for the in, uh, health benefit uh, for physically, basically uh, <clears throat> physical fitness or physical stability, uh, we can be seen uh, in some movement of the pillars and obliquity of the Hajj. Uh, we can see that they have uh, to the field of Arafah, Zdalifa. So this movement are a combination of uh, several physical leisure activities can stimulate the human body to stay active and fit. And where can strengthen the person's uh, muscle, airways, and blood flow while doing so, and also can reduce the body weight. Next, we can see that um, for Hajj, the, there's also health benefit in uh, psychologically because while performing the Hajj, a uh, person is required to abide by the rules. Uh, <clears throat> therefore, they, uh, it hopes that develop the psychological self discipline throughout the Hajj. So, besides that, um, with the recitation and the talbiyah, tasbih and tahmid, uh, it can make the person feel very calm and relaxed and uh, prevent from feeling anxious and uh, from feeling depressed. So next is, um, uh, we can see the benefit in socially. You see, in, during the performing the Hajj, all people of Muslim religion around the world will, uh, from different ethnicity, race, culture and background, come together perform this act so it will make um it will make as a symbolic of islamic unity strong bonding with each other and also people can learn other people's uh different language culture and also making silaturahim relationship so uh, i proceed with the uh <coughs> our groups uh is basically it's quite straightforward so the, the number of one is a, it's a scenario where a 50-year-old man with underlying hypertension comes for screening for Hajj eligibility. So we noted his renal function is currently already in stage 5 based on EGFR calculation and already require dialysis. But the patient, uh, he is still insists on going to Hajj. So the response <coughs> from this discussion uh, in this situation uh, we would like to explain to him regarding his current condition that clinically require, uh, requiring dialysis. So uh, there is the verse from Surah Ali Imran 97 showed that one of the requirements to have health, uh, which for him is not met, uh, uh, <clears throat> is a pilgrimage to this house, is an obligation by Allah upon whoever is able among the people. So you can see that uh, the meaning of whoever is able is not only uh, covered for uh, cost of the Hajj, but also have a good transportation and have a uh, safe system of uh, the, uh, the Hajj. So you can see also from the uh, guideline, based on the latest guideline, uh, it shows that uh, the pilgrim that uh, patient with chronic kidney disease stage more than four is not eligible for Hajj. I also, usually we will explain to the patient 
that uh, regarding all the physical activities required for the Hajj and the large amount of uh, people gathered in the Hajj. Because these hectic environments can cause him more exposed to the risk of infection as their vulnerable situation have the immune system. And also the hot and dry weather in Mecca can also cause him to be dehydrated and worsen his condition, might need him to get admitted to the hospital. And in, in the worst scenario, uh, it can cause death. Next uh, scenario that we're given for us is actually uh, a woman plans to perform Hajj and requests medication from uh, you to delay her process in order to ibadah. So what is your response? Basically, a menstruating woman is permissible to perform the requisite of Hajj except tawaf in Baitullah. Uh, it's in accordance with the statement of what? What mean uh, Aisha radiallahu an? Well, you can perform all the ceremonies of Hajj like the other people, but do not perform tawaf of the Kaaba to get into your menses. Sahih al Bukhari. So, in that, during uh, menstruation, uh, women are forbidden to pray, fasting, touch and embrace the Quran, sit in the mosque, and do the tawaf. So, tawaf is actually like a uh, my first previous uh, slide, it is one of the pillars of image and it is compulsory element for every <clears throat> So for this case, um, <clears throat> according to the Malaysian 33rd uh, National Muzakara Hajj, so the female pilgrims are allowed to use menstrual pills uh, to prevent or to shorten the duration of the menstruation. Uh, it is provided there is provided that they do not cause any harm. So, and the most common method is uh, is actually we give fine oral septic pills followed by oral strong. Maybe some uh other argue that menstrual separation is not necessary during Hajj because uh it's only tawaf is the uh, uh only thing that cannot be performed during the menstruation. However, the opportunity perform Hajj maybe only once in a lifetime because of its high cost and a limited annual quota of the properties set by the Saudi Arabian government. So in this case, I would allow the uh, female pilgrims to use uh, the, uh, the, the COCP to suppress her menses uh, as because like I said, it's the only for that the Hajj to complete the, uh, all the monastic Hajj. So number three is uh, from our, uh, is actually a question regarding vaccination. A vaccine refusal with the intention of coming touch, he refused to take the meningococcus and COVID-19 vaccination. So can you allow him to touch? So it would be, no, because according, even according to Spandrua Bapensa and Kesehatan Bakal Haji, it is compulsory for all for all Hajj prospects to take the meningococcal uh, vaccine at least within 10 days before their flight uh, to Mecca. Uh, and uh, <coughs> currently, all uh, all Hajj prospects also this year to complete uh, set the meningococcal, they have to complete three doses of COVID-19 vaccine recognized by the government of Saudi Arabia, which is um, which are as follows. Uh, that is acceptable by the uh, government of Saudi Arabia. Vaccination uh, is actually a method to trigger our immune system to create antibodies to protect ourselves against a disease. So being vaccinated uh, does not only protect us, but also the people around us through herd immunity. By achieving herd immunity, vaccination, can prevent diseases from spreading among population, which would result in unnecessary cases and death. So being vaccinated is one's choice, but the Hajj involves a big number of people coming all over. Uh, so it is important for them to uh, consider that well-beings of other individuals who had chosen to be vaccinated to avoid outbreak of any
Okay, thank you Dr. Radin for the presentation regarding Hajj and also vaccination during all, all the three scenarios and have a very good evidence from uh, the fatwa and also from the CPG from the MOH. So with that, I would like to invite uh, 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 the expert panel. Ustaz Abdul Rahman is uh, also with us now. And Ustaz Hasbubah also, I think, is already in the in the uh, Zoom. So uh, do you have any comment on this, uh, Ustaz? Ustaz? Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi taala wabarakatuh. Firstly, I agree with the presentation and the opinion from the presenter and the, uh, their group, uh, which means uh, the concept is tasarruf imam malu tu bi maslah. Uh, the policy or the decision from government is based on the benefit of all of the people. So when the government said uh, this uh, the policy, so we need to follow. As long as it's not uh, contradict with the Akhwah and Sunnah, okay, this is the first one, and then the second one, I, I think uh, the the principle we can uh, we uh, we can uh, use from this problem is maslahatul uh, ammah to qadimu ala maslahatul khasa, which means uh, the benefit of uh, the the majority is uh, we need to prioritize from the benefit or the interest of the individual, so. This uh, uh these two principles is according to the what the uh, uh what the uh, presenter uh, the presenter give the answer from from this case scenario. Okay, that's all. Any other uh input from uh, other expert panels? Yeah, maybe uh, Dr. Hasbullah if has anything that he can say, or otherwise I just give very brief comment. Yeah, uh, if allow me just, uh, I think the, the presenter well done, even though the major issue here is how we relate heart to the medicine, how the medical person uh, try to fix or try to attach himself to the height. But the, I think the three scenario given are very clear. Two of them are very clearly related to, uh, or two of them are not related to medicine as such. It is to the fiqh, last two. But the first one is a medical, that is uh, to check the ability of, of the uh, hajj or the person who performing hajj medically to, to advise if he or she fit to perform hard or not. That is a medical role, okay? But the other three, I think very cleverly, they put it there, but not uh, directly related to medicine, related to the fiqh itself. Ah, fiqh. But I think the second one, second question, I think very clever one, but our sister or our doctor were able to answer that question. Because uh, the mention, Lady who has mentioned, of course, it is not required to do uh, tawaf only. So this is nothing to do with uh, medicine. But from a perspective, they bring the hadith to show that uh, she only can do, uh, she do everything except the tawaf. Actually, that is a question. And that is a good test uh, about the awareness of the ahkam. Huh? Ahkam uh, al -hajj. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Abdul Rahman and Prof. Ibrahim. So, uh, with that, I think uh, we shall move to the next presentation. Uh, the group for Wudu is available, is it? Yes, yes I'm available. I'm sorry. So, uh, I think I, I shall invite you for the presentation. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, actually, I'm sorry because I cannot turn on my webcam since I'm in the middle of the traffic. Uh, because I have problem with my hotspot uh, at home, so I went to Sasmet to get internet connection. So, uh, however, I managed to get internet connection at the side road. So I present in a car right now. 
So my topic is about wudu. It's a very practical topic. So uh, my group consists of Halima Han Halima Hanizam, Afidatul Hanim, Marain, dan me myself Abdul Hamid. So before I proceed with with my presentation, I would like to uh, apologize because uh, my presentation will be in Malay, as my points of uh, book of reference is Panduan uh, Wudu dan Solat by Jakim and also Al Kitab Mata Al Badrin. Uh, uh, so I will straight uh, present my uh, topic. Uh, our topic is wudu. Uh, cara bersuci daripada hadas kecil adalah dengan berwudu atau bertayamum bagi mengharuskan solat. Eh. Jadi menggunakan uh, air yang suci lagi menyucikan pada empat anggota wudu iaitu muka, kedua tangan, kepala dan kedua kaki dengan cara yang uh, tertentu mengikut syarak. That is the meaning of wudu lah. Uh, Uh, before I proceed with uh, iaitu air mutlak, yakni air yang suci lagi menyucikan, tidak makruh untuk bersuci, boleh digunakan untuk menghilangkan hadas dan najis lah. Uh, sumber air mutlak uh, iaitu Dr. Hamid, I think uh, your internet is breaking, breaking up, is it? Dr. Hamid? Uh, uh, Dr. Jepal, I think uh, we... Uh, mata air, air yang uh, mengikut ketikan uh, dengan... Uh, Hello, dengar tak? Hello? Okay, baru dengar. Okay, okay. Sorry. Uh, jadi uh, saya sambung untuk uh, air mutlak tadi uh, iaitu air yang suci lagi menyucikan lah. Uh, jadi uh, jenis-jenis air yang lain seperti air musyamas, air yang, air yang terkena sinaran matahari panas, ianya suci lagi menyucikan tetapi makruh digunakan kerana boleh membawa mudarat. Air mustamal, air yang dipakai untuk bersuci, air ini suci tetapi tidak menyucikan. Jadi air ini tidak boleh dipakai untuk bersuci lah. Dan biasanya kita uh, last sekali adalah air najis lah, air mutan najis yang sedikit atau banyak terkena najis hingga mengganggu uh, warna, rasa dan bau lah. Okay. Uh, jadi yang ini adalah garis panduan berwuduk untuk pesakit yang uh, biasanya diamalkan uh, di hospital Kementerian Kesihatan Malaysia. Uh, ialah ada program hospital mesra ibadah uh, yang ini adalah cara-cara uh, untuk berwuduk lah iaitu pertama sekali adalah uh, membasuh muka berserta niat wuduk uh, dengan semua bahagian muka uh, diratai air kemudian uh, perlu membasuh kedua belah tangan sehingga meliputi siku eh. uh, sapu air di kepala, balut, uh, balutan di seluruh kepala yang sukar dibuka atau memudaratkan jika dibuka memadai hanya disapu air di atasnya dan uh, basuh kedua belah kaki hingga meliputi dua buku lali uh, ini adalah uh, panduan untuk uh, wuduk lah. kemudian uh, uh, diertikan juga tentang tayamum Uh, jika untuk orang yang tidak dapat berwuduk uh, Antara sebabnya tiada air Atau ada air yang hanya cukup untuk keperluan minuman uh, Apabila penggunaan air akan memudaratkan Atau membahayakan penyakit yang dihidapi Dan apabila ada tampalan atau bolutan seperti simen Pada anggota wuduk uh, atau pada badan uh, Iaitu tayamum ni uh, diertikan adalah uh, Menyapu muka dan kedua belah tangan meliputi siku dengan debu tanah yang bersih atau bahan lain yang boleh digunakan mengikut syarat tertentu. Uh, kalau uh, biasanya bahan-bahan uh, yang lain yang boleh digunakan untuk tayamum adalah tanah, batu dan garam bukit. Lah. Okay. Uh, jadi uh, ini adalah uh, uh, cara uh, untuk bertayamum. Eh. Uh, ratakan debu uh, tanah itu di atas uh, permukaan yang rata Tepuk tangan pada bahagian tayamum sekali Dan berniat ke, ketika memindahkannya sehingga menyentuh bahagian muka Sapu dan ratakan bahagian tayamum ke muka Dan kemudian buang uh, sakit-baki bahagian tayamum 
uh, untuk makluman uh, hanya debu yang melekat pada tangan saja dihukumkan uh, mustakmal. Jadi uh, tepuk tangan pada bahan tayamum sekali lagi. Lepas uh, sapu bahagian tayamum di tapak tangan uh, ke kiri kiri dan kanan sehingga meliputi siku dan begitu juga tapak tangan kanan ke kiri hingga meliputi siku. Okey, uh, jadi ini uh, apa yang uh, diamalkan di hospital sekitar Johor lah tempat saya bertugas sebelum ini uh, ialah adalah konsep hospital mesra ibadah di mana setiap uh, kubikal pesakit dilengkapi dengan uh, flyers, buku penerangan sebab yang sebab bagi kami yang paling penting adalah Uh, education ataupun uh, penerangan yang jelas kepada pesakit tentang kepentingan solat dan bagaimana cara untuk kita menunaikan solat dalam keadaan yang tertentu lah. Jadi uh, selain daripada buku, kenyataan, flyers, jadi kita akan uh, juga ada terdapat uh, botol semburan untuk uduk dan juga uh, uh, debu tanah lah untuk tayamum powder. Jadi uh, di sini juga uh, dalam yep. okey uh, jadi uh, di sini uh, saya uh, dalam uh, soalan yang diberikan juga untuk membezakan uh, wuduk dengan tayamum uh, dan juga apa persamaannya uh, jadi persamaan dari segi niat Uh, iaitu wuduk sahaja aku mengangkat hadas kecil kerana Allah Ta'ala dan tayamum sahaja aku bertayamum bagi mengharuskan fardu solat kerana Allah Ta'ala. Itu beza uh, niatnya. Dan juga anggota wuduk ada empat. Muka, kedua belah tangan, kepala dan kedua belah kaki. Uh, dan anggota tayamum adalah muka dan kedua belah tangan. Uh, bahan bersuci yang digunakan dalam wuduk adalah uh, air mutlak. Dan bahan bersuci bagi tayamum adalah debu tanah. Uh, bahan selepas bersuci, air yang digunakan untuk uduk adalah uh, dihukumkan mustakmal. Dan tapi debu uh, tidak menjadi mustakmal dan boleh digunakan semula selepas kita menjatuhkan debu tersebut lah. Jadi untuk hadas uh, uduk ni mengangkat hadas kecil, tayamum boleh digunakan untuk menghadas kecil dan hadas besar lah bagi yang mengikut, uh, mengikut syarat. Uh, syarat. Jadi uh, Kedua-dua wuduk dan tayamum ini uh, boleh uh, dibatalkan dengan perkara-perkara yang membatalkan wuduk lah. Iaitu keluar sesuatu daripada dua kemaluan, eh, kubul dan dubur. Hilang akal dengan sebab seperti tertidur, pita mabuk dan sebagainya. Kecuali tidur bagi orang yang tetap punggungnya. Menyentuh kemaluan dengan telapak tangan dan menyentuh uh, kulit lelaki atau perempuan dewasa yang bukan mahram tanpa berlapik. Okey, jadi kami pergi kepada uh, senario pertama. Your patient for arm, he ask you whether he, uh, whether he can take evolution or not, and how uh, can he perform it. Okey, jadi uh, saya beranggapan keadaan luka di tangan tu seperti gambar gambar yang saya letakkan lah. Jadi jawapannya adalah boleh. Boleh ia berwuduk. Eh? Seperti yang telah diterangkan dalam uh, ceramah pagi tadi lah. Okey. Jadi uh, caranya adalah mem, uh, membasuh muka berserta niat wuduk. Basuh di bahagian tangan yang boleh dikenakan air sehingga ke siku. Dan sapu air di atas pembalut. Jika mendatang ke mudarat tidak perlu disapu. Dan kemudian kesempurnakan wuduk uh, menyapu air kepada kepala dan membasuh kedua kaki hingga ke buku lali. Uh, solat yang perlu uh, solat yang dilakukan tidak perlu diulang. Uh, jadi ini untuk persoalan yang pertama. Dan senario kedua adalah your patient a 70 year old woman sustain a close fracture of left neck of femur and currently on skin traction. She was ask, uh, asking how she can perform ablution and solat. Jadi uh, di ortopedik biasanya kita menggunakan skin traction ni untuk uh, orang yang terlalu tua atau terlalu muda. Jadi keadaan uh, balutan itu seperti yang uh, ditunjukkan pada rajah dan keadaan posisi pesakit di atas kaki seperti inilah. Biasanya pesakit memang ada balutan di bahagian kaki tetapi tidak meliputi kawasan kaki hingga ke buku lali. Biasanya kaki dan buku lali itu dia terbuka jadi boleh terkena air. 
Lepas tu uh, pesakit yang baring di atas katil juga boleh dibangunkan eh? uh, Di prop up lah uh, Jadi uh, dia boleh melaksanakan uh, Boleh mengambil wuduk dengan bantuan Dan juga uh, boleh uh, melakukan solat dengan keadaan duduk berlunjur Okey, jadi uh, yang ini jawapan daripada kami lah. Pesakit boleh meminta pertolongan daripada jururawat wanita di ward ortopedik. Tetapi gambar saya adalah lelaki lah disebabkan oleh uh, faktor aurah lah eh. Jadi uh, pesakit ini uh, boleh uh, meminta bantuan daripada jururawat di ward uh, ortopedik uh, untuk mengambil air semahiyang lah wuduk. Jadi langkah satu semburkan air pada tapak tangan sehingga mengalir eh. Lepas tu kemudian uh, meratakan air ke seluruh bahagian muka pesakit dari atas ke bawah berserta dengan niat oleh pesakit lah. Jadi kemudian uh, membasuh tangan. Semburkan air terus pada kawasan tangan sehingga mengalir. Kami uh, yang uh, biasanya diamalkan di uh, hospital biasanya pastikan air yang disem air boleh digunakan dengan kaedah semburan tetapi pastikan air itu mengalir. Jadi meratakan air ke seluruh anggota tangan pesakit dari hujung siku ke hujung jari. Kemudian uh, teruskan dengan membasuh kepala, sembuskan, uh, semburkan air pada tapak tangan sehingga sedikit bertakung dan sapukan air pada bahagian kepala. Kemudian membasuh kaki, eh. semburkan air pada kedua belah uh, anggota kaki pesakit dan buku lali hingga ke hujung jari. Ha, pastikan air yang itu mengalir dan diratakan pada celah-celah kaki pesakit. Yang ini, jadi, uh, bi, jadi uh, pesakit juga bertanya, bolehkah dia melakukan solat? Jadi boleh, pesakit boleh melakukan solat dengan duduk di atas kaki, di atas katil dengan kaedah kaki berlunjur. Uh, untuk pesakit yang uh, dimasukkan ke ward uh, ortopedik, surgical, medical di hospital Sultan Ahmad Shah ni dia sangat beruntung sebab hospital ini sendiri memang menghadap kiblat. Jadi uh, tak ada isu tentang uh, pesakit tidak boleh solat di dalam ward. Jadi uh, pertama sekali pesakit menghadap kiblat, uh, uh, niat untuk solat, takbiratul ihram dan membaca al-Fatihah lah seperti posisi yang ditunjukkan dalam gambar. Kemudian uh, untuk rukuk eh, uh, pesakit boleh menundukkan badan sekurang-kurangnya kedudukan dahi berada setengah melepasi paras lutut dan sebaiknya kedudukan dahi berada setentang dengan tempat sujud. Uh, jika tidak mampu, lakukan seberapa mana yang mampu. Uh, mungkin tunduk sedikit ke hadapan. Okay. Kemudian untuk antidal, kembali duduk dan menegakkan badan dengan tangan berada di kedua, kedua belah peha. Kemudian untuk sujud, menudukkan badan lebih sedikit daripada uh, rukuk tadi. Uh, supaya dibezakan antara keduanya. Dan jika tidak mampu, lakukan semampunya walaupun paras di antara rukuk dan sujud itu sama. Dibolehkan. Uh. Dan setelah itu duduk di antara dua sujud seperti biasa Setelah itu dilakukan sujud sekali lagi seperti sujud yang pertama Setelah selesai sujud yang kedua kembali duduk menegakkan badan untuk rekaat yang seterusnya Begitulah dilakukan pada setiap rekaat Lakukan tasyahud dan kemudian ucapkan salam uh, setelah selesai tasyahud akhir. Sunat untuk memalingkan muka ke kiri dan uh, pada salam pertama dan eh, ke kanan pada salam pertama dan ke kiri pada salam kedua. Okey, jika pesakit ini menghadapi masalah maknanya uh, di ward ni ada masalah tak cukup staff. Uh, sedangkan tadi Prof Amin cakap uh, konsep hospital Islam tu ada uh, mempunyai staff yang mencukupi tapi kita tidak boleh elak dengan kebanjiran pesakit yang uh, saban hari makin bertambah uh, terutamanya di hospital kita dah di Sasmek. Jadi benda itu uh, kadang-kadang benda yang kita tidak boleh uh, tolak sebab satu shift biasanya lebih kurang 7 hingga 8 uh, staff nurse sahaja dan juga pesakit kita satu ward ada dalam 25 orang. Jadi satu nisbah tiga hingga empat. Jadi uh, mungkin ada kekurangan dari segi uh, uh, car, uh, pembantu. Jadi ataupun pesakit tiada siapa yang menunggu. Okey, jadi... Uh, pesakit yang ada kesukaran mengerjakan solat, digalakkan, untuk, dibolehkan untuk melakukan jamak uh, suri ataupun tamam uh, tanpa kasar. Uh. Dan uh, uh, dengan sekali wuduk atau tayamum. Tayamum ini kalau uh, dari mazhab 
uh, dari pandangan Hanafi. Dari pandangan Hanafi, satu tayamum boleh digunakan untuk seberapa banyak solat fardu. Tetapi dalam syafi'i, satu uh, tayamum boleh digunakan hanya untuk satu solat fardu. Dr. Hamid, are you still there? Tetapi untuk mudah uh, dan uh, rasanya boleh digunakan untuk... Uh, dengar tak? Okay, dengar, dengar, dengar. Hello, hello. Dengar tak? Yes, yes. Thank you. Okay. Sampai mana tadi? Ya? Saya ter... No, it's okay. Ter... It's just a short period that we lost you. It's okay. Ah, uh, uh, okay. Jadi... Uh, uh, do you still have your your slides? You have how many, uh, many slides yet? Still? No, no. Dah habis. Oh, okay, okay. Thank you. Uh -huh. Anything to conclude your presentation? So, uh, my conclusion actually... Uh, even if the patient is bedridden... Uh, or admitted in hospital, uh, Islam has provided a lot of uh, a lot of uh, method uh, that allow us to perform solah lah because uh, solah is a part of rukun Islam. So we have to uh, really take uh, into account. Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Hamid. Uh, thank you for your effort to find the internet to make sure the presentation is ongoing. Uh, with that, uh, I would like to invite uh, either uh, Ustaz Hasbubah uh, or Ustaz Abdul Rahman uh, or Prof to give a comment on the uh, this presentation. Maybe just I give very short comment about the title. The topic of wudu, uh, I think, should be under the title of Tahara. I do my voice is coming there. One. Yes, 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 bro. We can hear you. Yeah. Yes, bro. The, the title should be Tahara because uh, Tahara is a uh, include wudu also. We cannot uh, perform the most important ibadah, which is salah without tahara. And tahara here includes what I have mentioned, the three of them. Uh, if you have janaba, so the patient, actually this tahara is the most title related to the medicine. Because most of the medical, um, of the patients, sometimes it gets confused how they can do it. Luckily, uh, our uh, presenter, our doctor, say bring uh, cases of orthopedic and usually these people don't know how to perform tahara okay tahara here go to toilet for example clean is tahara uh do do tahara and more than that are kusul, kusul janaba. Ah, tahara also so these three will uh, make uh, confusing the patients a lot so i hope it that if the title was a tahara so within that one uh, you can discuss wudu uh, as a part of or type of the tahara. Of course, wudu is the most frequent one. Uh, that is why maybe it's being chosen. But the medical doctor or the medical uh, patients, usually sometimes they uh, also have problem of how to clean their special parts, okay? Or how they conduct uh, what we call as um, janaba, uh, remove the janaba, janaba sura or kubra. So what I mean, this is an issue to discuss because after that, uh, they related to them. Uh, to 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 salam or performing ibadah, even reading Quran. Maybe the patient want to read the Quran. Do it is do by tayammum, by wudu, and so on. So many things. Or if I have janaba, it is enough for me to do tayammum only, or what I should do, and so on. These questions arise to the patients. So I hope that uh, part should be discussed under the tahara, as is the first chapter of the Islamic fiqh. Thank you very much. Thank you, Prof. Ibrahim. Uh, any more input from other uh, expert panels for the present the for this presentation? If no more uh, uh no more input, so I would like to pass the session to Dr. Amin Nudin for the next two presentation. Thank you.
Okay, Assalamualaikum and a very good evening. Um, I'm Dr. Amin from Medical. So I guess we're just uh, going to proceed with the other two groups. Uh, one is under the topic of fasting and the other one is uh, abnormal uterine uh, bleeding. So um, for, I think we can proceed with the fasting group, uh, which consists of the uh, from internal medicine team. Uh, is Dr. Izzat ready? Uh, yes. Uh... Okay, yeah, please proceed. Okay. Uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. I'm Muhammad Izzat bin Muhammad Taha. My, I'm the representative of my uh, group, fifth group, which today I would like to present regarding uh, fasting. My group uh, supervised by Associate Prof. Dr. Azhar Shahril bin Azizan. Eh? So, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. First of all, there are three subtopic uh, in my presentation. First is describe fasting, introduction to the fasting and what are the benefits of fasting. And then a uh, list of the category, risk of fasting and diabetic patient and indication for fasting and case scenario. Lah. So, we proceed with a description of fasting, introduction and benefit of fasting in health. So first of all, what are the fasting in Islam? In Islam, an introduction. Fasting in Islam called saum in the Al Quran. Eh? The word saum literally means to abstain, to abstain, to withhold yourself. In Surah Al Maryam, chapter 19, verses 26, Allah Swt tell Mary, the mother of Jesus, I have go a fast swam for the sake of the merciful. So today I shall not speak to anyone. So saum means abstain yourself. The meaning I have go to abstain from speaking to everyone today. According to Sharia, the word saum means abstain from all those things that are forbidden during fasting from the break of the dawn to the sunset. And to do this with the intention of fasting. So fasting is a very important. It's, it's a, uh, it is a one of the five uh, key pillars in Islam. So fasting according to Sunnah, uh, first we need to take our sahur, which is pre-dawn meal, take iftar, uh, breakfast immediately after the sunset, and then during the fast, abstain from all false and deeds. Uh, during the fast, to do good charity and goodness to others and increase your worship and reading the Quran. Lah. So uh, the signs of fasting. Fasting me uh, legitimately accepted uh, by means of managing weight and also preventing the disease. Essentially, fasting cleans our body of toxin and force cells into the process that are not usually stimulated when steady stream of flu from food is always present. So when we fast, the body does not have its unusual excess of glucose. So during fasting, the cells resort to other means of material to produce energy. So as the result, body begins the process named gluconeogenesis, a natural process which producing its own sugar then helps the liver to convert non-carbohydrate material like lactate, amino acid, and fats into the glucose energy. So because our body conserves energy during fasting, our basal metabolic rate becomes more efficient, thereby, thereby lower, lowering our heart rate and blood pressure. So this, uh, these things are invalidate the fasting and things that do not invalidate fasting. Lah. So things that invalidate fasting is eating, so you cannot eat, you cannot drink, smoking deliberately, including taking any non-nourishing item by mouth, nose, or anus. Lah. So any opening in our body. Deliberately causing yourself vomit, uh, the beginning of menstrual, so in menses or post-childbirth bleeding, or even in the last moment before ni lah, sunset. Lah. So they are invalid, in, in, invalid fasting. And then sexual intercourse or other sexual contact, or like masturbation that result in ejaculation in men or vaginal secretion or organ, orgasm in women. So things that do not invalid, invalidate fasting, uh, for example, taking baths or shower, or using perfume, wearing contact lens, or using eye drop, taking injection or having a blood test, uh, using miswak or toothbrush uh, to clean your mouth, eating, drinking, or smoking unintentionally, uh, by means that you forget that one, the, the one that's uh, during the fasting time, sleeping during the daytime or having a wet dream does not break your fast. Kissing between husband and wife is allowed but it's not recommended. Lah. Okay, next, health benefit of fasting. Uh, we characterize by number one, it can help in reducing the weight, reducing in blood pressure control, lowering your cholesterol level, 
and lowering your risk of cardiovascular disease lah. And then reduce inflammation, better outcome for stroke survivors, boosted brain function, cancer protection, increased cell turnover, reduce insulin resistance, increase longevity and better night sleep. So others in Islam, uh, intermittent fasting also is a sunnah lah, uh, which we can do outside the Ramadan uh, month. Studies have investigated that effect of uh, intermittent fasting on mental well-being and the whole fasting lead to the improvement. So for example, in people that had to undergo laparoscopic cholecystectomy, in, uh, intermittent fasting was found to increase post-operative comfort and reducing level of stress. And also, uh, caloric restriction can help in mood stability and decrease level of tension. So number, number second second part of my presentation is the list, the category risk of fasting among diabetic patients and indication to break the fasting. So uh, this is also the same like the first, uh, my first slide. It's uh, one of the five pillar. Uh, okay, potential increased risk of acute complication in during fasting in diabetic patient is hypoglycemia, hyperglycemia, dehydration and uh, diabetic ketoacidosis ah, which is a medical emergency lah. okay fasting is a spiritual issue which patient make their own decision after receiving appropriate, appropriate advice from religious teaching and from healthcare provider patient who insist on fasting need to be aware that associated risk of fasting during on and the technique to decrease the risk so patient must be we must educate patient that if the patient have high risk or moderate risk or low risk, that patient must be aware that all of the risk if a patient insists of uh, fasting. Lah. So we must educate about the signs and symptom of hypoglycemia, symptom of hyperglycemia and also dehydration. So blood glucose checkup during Ramadan does not break the fast. Lah. So during Ramadan, maybe patient with diabetic need to check their uh, sugar more frequently, lah, more regularly. So first group is very high risk, high risk group, fasting not recommended. Uh, for example, patient with severe or recurrent hypoglycemia within three months prior to Ramadan, severe hypoglycemia with average fasting pre-meal plasma more than 16 or HbA1c uncontrolled more than 10%, history of hypoglycemic unawareness, poor glycemic control before months of Ramadan, patient that uh, having DKA, diabetic ketoacidosis or HSS, hyposomolar state within three months prior to Ramadan, patient in acute illness, performing intense physical labor, pregnancy, chronic dialysis patient, and also patient with significant dementia or cognitive deficit. So this patient having very high risk, but uh, we, uh, fasting is not recommended, but patient can fasting but with a lot of complication and patient must be educated well lah, before patient wants to proceed with their fasting. So second group is high risk, may choose not to fast, moderate hyperglycemia, blood glucose 8.3 to 16 or HbA1c between 8 to 10. Lah. Uh, just now more than 10, this one is 8 to 10. Significant microvascular or microvascular complication, living alone and treated with insulin or saponal urea. Because in this in this type of patient, the risk of hypoglycemia is very important lah, because they live alone eh, and they're treated with insulin. So usually patient need to take meal lah, prior to take the after they take in the insulin. Patient with comorbid condition that present additional risk factor like heart failure, stroke, malignancy, and renal impairment, elderly more than 75 years of age. So this is a high risk. I may choose not to fast. Third group, moderate risk, may choose to fast with portions. So people with type 2 diabetes mellitus with no complication, HbA1c less than 8, and patient that only treated with lifestyle intervention and with oral uh, antihypoglycemic agent. Lah. So low risk, may choose to fast lah, people with diabetic, but no complication, HbA1c less than 7, treated with lifestyle and treated with only oral uh, antihypoglycemic anti medication. So with encouragement on adequate hydration during permissible hours to reduce risk of dehydration and postural hypotension, especially in hot, humid environment. Lah. So this is the advice lah, to patients with diabetic that want to, 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 to do fast. Okay, so uh, who is exempted from fasting in Ramadan? 
So number one is traveler lah. So traveler they have roof saw lah. Kelonggaran roof saw. So traveler can uh, can exempted from fasting because uh, during travel uh, work apa, long working travel time and eh? sick person patient who are un unwell woman experiencing uh, menstruation or postnatal bleeding pregnant or breastfeeding woman and frail elderly lah. So this kind of this kind of people can exempted from fasting in Ramadan. So they have rukhsah lah, kelonggaran and maybe they they need to 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 fast after month of Ramadan lah to qada lah. So question number one, uh, question session uh, your patient is G1 para 0 at 24 weeks POG with diabetes complicating pregnancy. So she wants to know if she should fast her HbA1c at booking was 9.8 lah. Uh, so patient ni uh, at 24 week ke memang non case of diabetes and HbA1c is 9.8. So the question is the want to know uh, if she should fast lah. So fasting and pregnancy we need to know that fast uh, pregnancy ada uh, change in in our body physiology lah blood delivery to uterus and placenta increase from 80 to 600 to 800 mils uh, about 20% of cardiac output to the uterus compared to 2% in non pregnant lady lah so cardiac output to supply the 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 placenta increase lah during the pregnancy pregnancy changes increase total volume lower the bp increase the heart rate 10 to 20% does increase the cardiac output to meet demand of growing uterus uh, fetus and placenta so dehydration can exacerbate maternal tachy leads to fetal tachycardia. Now, dehydration is very important. Maternal blood continuously supply glucose to fetus. Does pregnant mother have lower blood glucose compared to non-pregnant mother? Stomach compression from the growing fetus causing heartburn. Mother can eat large meal but needs more frequent meal and to ingest enough calorie to herself and to the fetus. Hypercoagulopathy state, which is dehydration, should be avoided. And while pregnant Muslim, who are exempted from fasting during Ramadan, some with non-diabetic type 1 and type 2 or gestational insist on fasting. These women are at very high risk group. Lah. So pregnancy outcome in hyperglycemia, if patient to still keen and want to, to further their fasting, they must know uh, what are the complications and what are the risks that can happen. Lah. So hyperglycemia in associated with adverse pregnancy outcome, number one, birth weight, uh, above 19, so baby will be larger than usual lah. Hot blood serum C peptide level above 90 percentile, primary cesarean delivery, clinical neonatal hypoglycemia, premature delivery, shoulder dystocia or injury that occur during delivery, intensive neonatal care, hypobilirubinemia, preeclampsia, increased risk of major congenital malformation with high level of HbA1c lah. So it's a very important to 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 make sure that your HbA1c and diabetic control well before you're pregnant. Lah. So effect of Ramadan fasting and pregnancy outcome, eh? maternal outcome, risk of hypoglycemia during daytime, hyperglycemia during sahu and also iftar, uncontrolled glucose level can affect fetal and maternal well-being. So fetal outcome, conflicting outcome, no high level of evidence. Uh, but other study yang said they can lead to preterm delivery, neonatal birth weight were not affected by maternal fasting, but placenta weight has significant lower in fasting mother. So question number three, 30 year old man with underlying RVD, uh, retroviral disease on 12 hourly convivir, anti, anti retroviral medication insists on fasting. What would your response be? So First of all, in this kind of patient, we need to adhere. Uh, what is the adherence like before? What is the his viral load? How long has been on ART? Uh, any opportunity infection? Has the patient achieved uh, viral suppression? So the importance of adherence to successful antiretroviral therapy is well established. Yeah. So patient compliance to medication is very important in this kind of patient. So treatment adherence is important to consistently suppress viral load. So patient need they must be taking this medication to suppress the viral load to maintain high CD4 cell count to prevent from AIDS, prolong survival and reduce risk of transmitting HIV to other people. Poor adherence predict continue progression to AIDS and encourage during drug resistance and increase the risk of death. Lah. So adherence takes a particular important and adherence may, in, may impact not only viral separation but also emergence of permanent treatment resistance. So these patients are not uh, advised 
to 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 perform fasting lah because of the adherence to the to the medication fasting in antiretroviral treatment no strong evidence studying the impact of uh, ERT timing on viral separation or treatment failure small study in 28 subject have demonstrated no significant negative impact on virologic or immunologic outcome or adjusting the timing so provided that the patient do not miss the dose lah so patient can fast but we need to adjust the time of the medication potentially risk of altering pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic by some behavioral changes associated with ramadan larger studies need to confirm this throughout the assessment and evaluation of each and individual case so the summary fasting in ramadan is one of the five pillar is a compulsory for healthy adult people with illness are exempted from fasting fasting is a spiritual issue for which patient make their own decision as healthcare provider we must equip ourselves with knowledge and always refer to religious authority to offer appropriate advice to our patient that's all for my presentation thank you okay thank you very much uh, dr izat for a very thorough and precise uh, presentation in regard to uh, fasting okay so as you um, have uh, presented before um, especially in this chronic patient uh, in this uh, in, who have been diabetes and also uh, RVD patients, they are usually asymptomatic, so they don't feel anything, and they think they are, um, you know, they uh, they are not sick, so they want to continue fasting. So uh, the point where you highlighted um, in terms of education is very very important, and then you have to adjust to the understanding of the patient um, in terms of your explanation. Okay. Um, uh, I would like to invite um, the expert panel, uh, maybe Ustaz Abdul Rahman, uh, maybe you can uh, give a, a bit of comment uh, in regard to fasting issue, and maybe you can hear um, opinion from Prof. Ibrahim as well. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. I'm not sure uh, the presenter, Dr. Izzat, already mentioned or not. Uh, for the, the best for the patient who have a problem with diabetes, for example, the best is to uh, try to, uh, to fast uh, first, and then uh, when I uh, feel uh, hypoglycemia or hyperglycemia or others, and then he can break the fast. And uh, not at the, at, the, uh, at the beginning, not not fast. Uh, so the, the best way, try to fast, uh, fast first, and then when I uh, have the uh, symptom and so on, and uh, with recommendation from the doctor, and can uh, break the fast. Because uh, some misconception from from the uh, patient and so on, uh, from the subuh they already eat and uh, so on. Uh, so it's not uh, not uh, the right way uh, for me. Uh, but if I have a symptom and so on, it's okay for them to break the fast. That's all. Okay, thank you, Dr. Uh, Brahman, uh, for your opinion. Um, is there any uh, other input from Prof. Ibrahim? Maybe Prof. is not um, with us already in the list. Um, but it's okay. All right. Um, yep. Okay. So I think uh, uh, we can conclude uh, this presentation uh, with the input from Ustaz Rahman just now. So um, to, uh, to highlight the point that Ustaz is saying is that if the patient you considered um, is able to understand your, your information uh, when you are educating them, and you can uh, give it a try. For them, if you think it's a, you know, the patient can understand uh, and uh, the, the risk is manageable, why not them try first and if develop any complication, they can they can break their fast and maybe um, you have to give them some time um, to stabilize your uh, chronic condition first before starting again. Okay, um, so um, I think we move on to the next group. Um, so the next group is abnormal uterine bleeding uh, in, uh, from the group uh, that's Dr. Nura Atika, Dr. Nur Lisa, Dr. Anthony, Dr. Shahida and Dr. Azmi. Uh, maybe one to present if want to present. Maybe you can share your slide if you're ready. Okay, uh, all right, you may proceed. Okay, uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Um, anyone can, everyone can hear me? Yes. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, first of all, Alhamdulillah for the opportunity given for us to deliver the topic of abnormal uterine bleeding. And I also uh, would like to express our gratitude to our, gratitude to our supervisor, uh, Assistant Prof. Dr. Azhar Sharif for guiding us through um, prepping this presentation. So um, I'll be the representative of my uh, group members to present the topics of AUB. So without further ado, I would like to proceed with the definition and causes of abnormal uterine bleeding. Actually, AUB refers to a broad term that um, describes the irregularities in menstrual cycle involving the frequency, regularity, duration, and volume of flow outside the pregnancy. A normal menstrual cycle has a frequency of uh, 24 to 38 days, last 7 to 9 days with um, blood loss average about 5 to 18 mils. A variation in any of these parameters constitute to AUB. And as we can see here, there are numerous causes of uh, AUB. And FIGO and uh, current uh, classification of causes uh, is according to the FIGO, <clears throat> which uh, already categorize the causes into two main groups, which are structural causes and non-structural causes. Actually, the acronym of uh, Palm Coin is a very useful uh, to classify the causes of uh, abnormal uterine bleeding. As you can see, the structural cause mainly consists of polyps, adenomyosis, leiomyoma, malignancy, and hyperplasia. Whereas the non-structural causes are contributed by co coagulopathy, ovulatory dysfunction, endometrial, iatrogenic, and not yet classified. Um, okay, moving on to scenario number one. A 30-year-old woman who had irregular menses, but usually her menstrual cycle is ranged from 7 to 10 days. Starting this month, her menses has prolonged till beyond 20 days. The question is, can she perform solat as well as fasting? And what is the explanation and reason behind it? Based on our discussion and reference, yes, she can perform solar and fasting as usual because she is having istihadah and not menses. First of all, let's take a look on the definition based on Shara about height and istihadah. According to Shara, height is a natural discharge of blood from vagina of a woman while she is healthy for a certain period of time. And from the Kitab of Al-Takrira Al-Sa'idah, it was written, the minimum duration of menses is 24 hours and maximum duration of menses is 15 days. And normally, menses occurred in six to seven days. Why is the hadah based on Shara is an irregular discharge of blood from the lowest vein located under uterus after the longest period of normal menstruation cycle, postpartum bleeding, or blood discharge continuously after the normal menstrual cycle. Istihada is also known if the woman had a blood discharge times two with a gap of pure less than 15 days, blood discharge after the longest period of 15 normal menstruation days, blood discharge for less than 24 hours, blood discharge before the age of nine years old, and blood discharge after a period of 60 postpartum bleeding days. There are four situations if a woman experience istihadah. <clears throat> it is divided into two main groups, which are muqtadi'ah, the woman who never had menarche before, and muqtada, the woman who had experienced menses before. It is further divided into two categories. One referred to a woman who is unable to determine the blood characteristic, and another one who is able to do so. According from this scenario, and based on the facts given, the woman is said as Muqtadah Mumayiza, the woman who experienced istihadah and able to differentiate the characteristic of the blood. Hence, it is prioritized to follow the method of tamis rather than adat. This is because the signs for height is upon the blood and its characteristic for the woman who experienced it. So the ability to determine characteristic of blood is prioritized compared to the counting based on adat. What is adat and what is tamis? Tamis is uh, ability to differentiate color of the blood, whether it is black, red, brown, yellow, cloudy. And also the ability to differentiate the smell and consistency, whether it is odorless, fishy smell, a thin liquid or thick or black clot. What I did is women who have menstruated before and know her pattern. But looking at the pattern of menstruation, it is only used when there is istihadah blood that is continuous with menstruation, which is more than 15 days. This is accordance with the hadith narrated by Asha radiallahu anhu on the question of Fatima binti Abi Hubaj to the Prophet, peace be upon him. 
on herself who is impure due to experiencing istihada. Fatimah binti Abi Hubaish said to Allah Messenger Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, "Oh Allah, oh Allah Messenger, I do not become clean from bidding. Shall I give up my prayers?" And Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam replied, "No, because it is from a blood vessel and not the menses. So when the real menses begin, give up your prayers, and when the period has finished, wash the blood off your body, take a bath, and offer your prayers." This is reference I took from Sahih Al Bukhari three zero six. Okay, moving on to question number two, we have a scenario where a 58-year-old woman with a persistent postmenopausal bleeding refused any gynecology assessment and would like to opt for alternative treatment. How, we, how would we approach this situation? As for this case, we have divided the approaches into three main aspects. First, is either to meet the patient alone or together with the family members or the caretaker. Second approach is patient's autonomy versus patient-centered care. This is the best as um, we, we conclude the management based on shared decision-making together with the patient. And third approach is from the Islamic perspective. As we can see here, this is the analytical approach for refusal of treatment. As we can see here, these items focusing on the quality of care relationship between the patient and healthcare professional. If we follow the analytical approach, we might, we might have the reason of um, patient's refusals for the gynae assessment as uh, stated in our scenario. First, we have to getting to know patients, uh, our patients. Um, before having a conversation, let's uh, take into account that we have to build trust. Of, we have to build trust so that the patient will easily reveal what is the primary concern regarding her clinical illness. Um, to do so, we have to study a bit about a social and family background of the patient and um, cultural belief or religion belief of the patient herself. And then, as for the clinical status, we have to make sure that the patient is understand what is the problem that she is having, what is the seriousness of it. And somehow, <clears throat> sometimes patient may not aware or may not uh, understanding that uh, clinical symptoms that the patient has is serious. <clears throat> And then next step is we have to identify the existence of impairments that the patient has, whether she has impaired cognitive or any psychiatric issues. We also have to study her emotion as well. Be exam to the patient, be empathy to the patient, listen to the patient and treat a patient as a whole. After we have identified all this, it is time for us to relay all the information <clears throat> required for the patient to help her understand further what is the problem behind the uh, behind her symptoms. This is um, uh, we can do this um, like uh, we can uh, explain to her regarding the details, explain the nature of the disease. What could it be? What could postmenopausal bleeding be? Is it uh, risk? Is it uh, related to malignancy? And if it's not, and, and if it is not treated what it can lead to. Maybe she isn't aware that her condition might be that serious. And also explain the process involved in making the diagnosis and making a correct management for her. Involve her as well. What is the limitation of her in um, coming for follow-up later? Or what is the limitation for her in refusing the gynae assessment at first? We also have to explain the patient um, regarding that um, the history taking and physical examination may not be suffice enough to rule out any uh, serious issues. So we have to explain that we have to proceed with the physical examination uh, and then inform uh, and then obtain consent from a patient to proceed with gynae assessment, such as a green pap smear, obtain endometrial sampling, and maybe we can use other modalities to help us making diagnosis, such as uh, abdominal scan and then transvaginal scan, and explain about the expected outcome of each 
uh, tests that uh, done to the patient. We have to let the option uh, to the patient be widest as possible so that patient will have um, will have uh, options so that uh, it is so that patient will understand that uh, it is not only just a gynae assessment to making a diagnosis and maybe it needs a further assessment for her and maybe after all uh, the information given we can see this patient in a next appointment so that we can give her some time to think through to think through and give feedback to us later after all of this um, explanation given, it is a patient's right to decide for herself and bear in mind that we have to provide medical confidentiality at all times. Okay, from the Islamic perspective, um, maybe this patient is refused for gynae assessment as she was attended by the opposite gender, by the health care, by the health professional with opposite gender. Ideally, it is best if they are cared for by a clinician or a nurse with the same gender. And if a gender specific care is impossible, this is the time that we uh, should involve a female chaperone or patient relative uh, during our examination or even the communication itself. As for the Muslim uh, patient, if the patient is concerned more towards the gender preference, it is uh, showed as a modesty in Islam to protect her aura. Even though the patient is a non-Muslim, it is important and essential to note that the beneficiaries of the Islamic ethical framework are not for just Muslim alone, rather it goes beyond the religious boundaries. And in other words, everyone can benefit from Islamic juristic principle, given that the recipients are convinced of Islam, universality and its orientation towards the benefit for all humanity. Last but not least, um, Explain the patient of uh, regarding the concept of tawakal. Help the patient to understand by explaining to her that she should put into efforts as much as she can, including seek a proper treatment before she putting reliance of Allah to cure the illness of hers. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Norisa, for the presentation. Um, so as we can... Um, See, it's a very quite thorough and uh, concise presentation. For the first scenario, um, I think it's more the focus is more on faith issue. But uh, I think to highlight that sometimes um, the patient is concerned um, regarding her ibadah uh, due to this issue, but uh, she is maybe afraid or not sure whether she, it is appropriate or not to ask the, the doctor regarding this issue. So sometimes uh, we as a doctor, we can volunteer or ask them if they have any concern regarding these issues and educate them in terms of that. Okay, and for the second one, I think it's more of um, uh, more um, a, a, a bit more about palliative um, issues as well, uh, where um, yeah, uh, Dr. Nolisa highlighted uh, that we should approach um, thoroughly in terms of the view from the patient and explore the reason why they are refusing uh, the treatment uh, offered in the hospital. Okay, um, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I would like now to invite um, uh, the expert panel if they have any input that they can uh, contribute to this, uh, to, the, to the group, to the topic. So we have, um, again, Ustaz Abdul Rahman, uh, if you want to add anything. Uh, we have also Prof Amin, if you want to add anything. And any other expert panel. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, I like uh, the presenter Dr. Nolisa. I'm not mistaken. Uh, that I like about the tamjiz and adat for the height. It's the how I uh, for the height. I I have one question uh, uh, for doctor. Uh, if there is contradict uh, for the number of adat and tamjiz, we need to follow the adat or tamjiz. You understand my question? Uh, yes, Dr. Whether is, it, it is preferably to prioritize the other or tamis, Dr. Yeah, yes. If, if there is contradict between the number of uh, other and tamis, which one we need to follow first? Uh, 
um, according to the reference, it is prioritized to follow the method of Tamiz rather than Adat. Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. Just question. Uh, because uh, this uh, fact, uh, not all the women, even uh, men, know about this. Because with uh, the other and Tamiz, we need to prioritize the Tamiz first. Uh, because Tamiz, we know the difference between uh, the color and so on. Uh, the other is the kebiasaan. So we need to uh, prioritize the differentiate thing before the the norm or uh, the normal ataupun uh, the other. Okay. Thank you for the answer. Thank you, Doctor. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Rahman, for the input. Um, is there any any other comment from uh, any other expert panel? Uh, maybe regarding the the second question, um, how to approach a patient is not um, you know, open to the treatment. Okay, if not, um, if not, then actually uh, we have already um, finished with the group um, in the timetable that uh, supposed to present today. Uh, initially, we suggested that uh, those who will present tomorrow morning to be to be to present again uh, to present early uh, in in to this evening. However. Uh, we got the information that they have a poor line network, so uh, they prefer uh, to pre present their present uh, to do their presentation tomorrow instead. So um, uh, we just uh, agree with that. Um, uh, we can end up early today. Uh, just a housekeeping announcement for you to um, look at the chat uh, chat box and fill in the attendance form, uh, and then uh, we will see again uh, inshallah tomorrow. For the next session. Okay, for after you fill in uh, uh, the uh, make sure you fill in the attendance form and for the CPD we will give uh, the QR code tomorrow at the end of the uh, session tomorrow inshallah. Okay, by that uh, I think we are going to end the session uh, so we can end the session with Tasbih Kifarah Surah Walaam. Baby.